always striving for some new technological innovation. Who cares about the company? What about us? And that's certainly the case in Monsters Incorporated. Hey. That's right, baby. Uh -huh. In every story that we create at Pixar, there is something in the story that is something we don't know how to do. I love working with that big guy. We don't want to just repeat ourselves. We want to, you know, push the envelope technically. So whenever they say, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do that, I'm thinking now, I've got used to that, but they're probably going to figure it out in a couple of days. <laughs> do you hear that? It's the winds of change. This film's always been a film about a uh, big hairy monster. You're the boss, you're the boss, you're the big hairy boss. And that, of course, got everybody very worried initially because fur in general is one of the hardest things to do in computer graphics. Sullivan is in about 600 shots in the film. On a big furry, eight foot tall monster, you need to have about three million hairs. Is that a joke? Tell me, joke. Can you imagine if, like, you had an animator who had to go through and animate every single hair? That would just, it would just drive him insane, basically. All our animators would quit. That's it. I'm out of ideas. We're closed. We had to figure out a way for that hair to move automatically. And that's the genius. We engineered a whole dynamic system that basically let the animators not have to worry about that at all. Our animators just move the character, and then computationally, all the fur figures out how to move itself. And that allows us to achieve a level of visual complexity that we never could without this dynamic, intelligent fur. So he'll do this movement, and the fur is aware of gravity and some sort of wind resistance, and it responds appropriately. And uh, the same thing is true of cloth. When I move my arm, this is very sophisticated bending and folding of that cloth. It's just completely random, and, and, it, and it moves, you know, all over the place. <laughs> so we came up with a dynamic system, just like the hair that deals with the cloth. This is perfect. <laughs> the animators could just have to run around and be cute. And after the animation was done, we would apply this automated animation to her T-shirt that would figure out how everything should move and fold. The software that we're using is simulating the basic laws of physics, such as the bending and the stretching and the shear and that kind of thing. The nightmare is over! The dynamic puts us into a whole different realm where you're not asking an animator to create motion, but now we're asking a computer program to create motion. And so the cloth moves by itself, the fur moves by itself, and this is where we put a tremendous amount of energy. What a plan! Simple, yet insane! door vault is pretty amazing at Monsters, Inc. It's got something like 23 million closet doors stored in it. Whoa. Oh, boy. We literally... I think that's a little cardboard of paper, and the renderer thinks about it as a little piece of paper, and so it's very efficient to render, but it tends to look from medium to far distances just like a real door. I still don't understand. Basically, what I did was uh, create a, a sort of program that figured out exactly how the door should move. Oh. If the door is going around a curve, then it needs to swing out to approximate that centrifugal force. So just really nice organic um, quality to it. It looks almost like a traffic jam in San Francisco. We're working on scenes right now that involve Sullivan in the Himalayas. He had to be extremely foggy, so to give this feeling of, you know, coldness, very hostile environment. No! No! Uh, everybody was uh, a little afraid of, the, you know, the complexity of the technological challenges that we have to actually make this environment to look believable. They really like... No, it can't be done. Yeah. That's good. But in particular, we have two specific sequences that happen to be in completely a snow environment under like a snowstorm. Yeah, and, but then, then you challenge us and say, you know, come on, you can do it. You, you can do it. You're awesome. You're still not listening. <laughs> we actually do model those snowflakes individually that fall. <laughs> and we have to take into account things like the wind, because the wind also would affect. shirt, Sullivan and simulated hair, we were looking at um, probably somewhere in the order of 900 to 1,000 shots that we're going to have simulation. So we're really introducing a whole new step in the pipeline. Um, it's the first time we've actually used simulation in production, and so we were concerned about some of the technical issues that might come up with simulation. So what we decided to do is that because it was something that was really going to have to be done all the time, um, we would restructure things a little bit. We needed some of the real how should I say, intellectual manpower that we have in, a, in an effects department to solve some of our more challenging simulation problems. But at the same time, 
I mean, it is sort of the infrastructure of a department that's really used to dealing with every single shot of the film. And so what we did is we took rendering that had that infrastructure in it, and we took effects that had that, that brain power, and we mushed them all together, and we added some people, and trained everybody on simulation, and came up with the shots department. Um, a great benefit of doing this is that we had an incredibly diverse set of skills within that department, and so we could tackle all, all kinds of problems. So things that we normally would have done through the standard modeling animation kind of pipeline, like um, the hazmats when they burst in and swing down on the ropes, or Sullivan when he's running through the hallway and he's got the, um, the blanket hanging. Tom Porter, Supervising Technical Director on Monsters Incorporated. Hi, my name is Steve May. I was a simulation and effects sequence supervisor. Hi, I'm Michael Fong. I'm a sequence supervisor for Monsters Incorporated. So part of the character making process involves building stand-in models or test models. And in our case here, we have Johnson, the, the test model for eventually what would become Sullivan. The art direction of this film was obviously diverging very far from the sort of uh, suburban look of Toy Story and Toy Story 2, we had to define an entire monster world, and I thought it very important to be able to create 3D animation right off the bat to see whether the sort of direction we were going in with the pre-production art was what we wanted to do. So we put together this little conversation between Mike and Sullivan. Obviously, Mike here went through a phase where he had no arms. We wanted to see whether the animators could get an expressive character dealing only with his legs as the only appendage. I actually thought it was quite successful, but uh, of course in the end we attached arms to Mike. There were a lot of issues on these uh, early tests that we undertook. Here we're looking at Sullivan uh, with tentacles. Uh, one of the obvious questions was whether you even wanted to commit to a main character walking with uh, tentacles over the course of a two-hour film. In the end we rejected the idea, I think largely because the audience's eyes were commonly looking at the tentacles at a time when they should have been looking at Sullivan's face. Here is Sullivan close to his final form with the first hair test that convinced us we were definitely on the right track. This was a high point in the hair investigation. So here we have another test version of Sullivan. This one is um, Mulligan. We did a lot of animation tests to uh, make sure that the fur held up in a variety of situations. We were really concerned about various actions and poses that the character could go through. The fur is a fairly complicated process. The hairs are moved by a computer program, and that means that each one of those hairs is somewhat out of our control. So we had to make sure that that software worked really, really well. And the only way to do that was to run Sullivan through every kind of test we could think of until we kind of solved every little hitch and problem that you know could come up over the course of that film. The directors had this uh, idea at one point that Sullivan would wear glasses throughout the film. Uh, this is a dangerous sort of idea. Pixar animation in, in general is very careful to make sure that the eyes of the character are perfectly readable. The eyes turn out to be a very clear way of expressing for doing the fur test, and we made some monsters with it. We added tentacles or legs or in some cases arms and, uh, and generated a hair scare and uh, some other background monsters for the movie. This shot really scared me to death. This is the kind of shot that, as an effects artist, that makes the sweat roll down your forehead and makes your heart beat fast. Uh, these tests show uh, the process that we took of the shot as it moved from animation, where the ground is just a, a kind of a flat plane and his body just intersects it. And then it shows how we simulated the fur to show the effect of the wind that would later also drive the snow that we would show in these shots. The snow is actually done in several layers. There's a the really fine powdery snow that kicks up when he hits it first. There was a level of chunky snow that made these kind of large pieces of snow that would fly out in front of him and actually impact on the ground. And then there was some very, very, very fine uh, powdery snow that almost looked like a soft cloud. And this is in addition to the snow that's just going to be falling down from the sky. 
This is the final version of the shot. This has all the effects elements added together, and uh, probably the most important element was the snow and the fur. In the end, we modified the way that the first software worked, so we add things into his, his hair. As each hair is grown, we take into account a number of factors, how long he's been out in the snow, what direction the wind is blowing, etc., to determine the likelihood that snowflakes will occur on certain parts of his fur. And for that shot, in the end, we ended up with over a million individual snowflakes. So once again, we've gone back to earlier tests of Sullivan, and this 